إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد the third and last category is a permissible part. The permissible kind of uh, uh, relationship with the non-Muslims. And that's in the verse, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلكم في الدين ولم يخرجكم من, ديارك من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقصتوا إليهم. Allah does not forbid you to deal justly and kindly with those who, fought against, with those who did not fight against you uh, on the account of your religion, nor drove you out of your homes. Uh, Allah loves those who deal with uh, equity. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-muqsitin. This is in the same surah. This verse is clear on this matter. Very clear. This is the third category. The many try to deny wala'in bara' the first two because they don't understand wala'in bara'. Part of wala'in bara' is that there's permission to be kind and just to others. That's part of the understanding of wala and bara. Something that wala and bara means you have to, every time you see your neighbor, spit on him or take the trash and dump it on his porch every day or break his car windows as, as they used to do to us when, when we moved in certain neighborhoods. Uh, because because they, 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 they'll say that because of their misunderstanding of wala and bara. The thing is that we have solid, firm wala and bara, but at the same time, we treat them as we're ordered. For example, in visiting, in giving gifts, in da'wah. Many try to deny wala and bara because they don't understand wala and bara. Part of wala and bara is permission to be kind and just with others. Some think that wala and bara means you have to spit on your neighbor's, neighbor's face every time you see them or throw trash in their front yard every time you leave your house or break their windows every morning. Uh, ignorance of people cause them to deny portions of wala and bara. Especially the modernists, uh, they deny totally the first and second category. That's, that's not in their belief. We have wala and bara, but at the same time, we treat them the way Allah ordered us to treat them. Take for examples, with proof, da'wah to non-Muslims. We have wala and bara, yet at the same time, we convey this message to them of da'wah. There's no conflict. There's no inconsistency. Because our feelings, our emotions, our actions, every part of us is restrained by Allah who told us how to act. Having wisdom and mercy in conveying da'wah does not in any way contradict with wala and bara. And da'wah is not just preaching. Many think that da'wah is just to go and preach to them. And that's one of the forms of da'wah. But being kind so that opens the other, the other people's hearts to da'wah, that's part of da'wah. That doesn't conflict with the heart belief of wala and bara. And the love and despise portion of wala and bara. There's many verses in the Quran that back this up. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawaidati al hasanati wajadilum bilati yahsan in surti nahal. Wala tu jadilu wala al kitabi illa bilati yahsan in surti al ankabut. When Allah sent Musa to Fir'aun and he ordered him to convey the message, Idhaba ila Fir'aun inna hu taha fa kula lau kula layin al alau yatadakar wa yahsha in surti taha. In Surah Ali Umran, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Many verses show that the Prophet ﷺ was lenient in da'wah or was ordered to be lenient. He was a mercy to mankind and not even mankind. He was a mercy to mankind and even inanimate matters. He, used, he was ordered to speak to them in the best words. And even when Allah sent Musa to Fir'aun, he was ordered to speak to him kindly. Another example of this category is eaten from the slaughter of the people of the book. That's a second example. 
A third example in this matter is marriage from the people of the book. وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتُ وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُ الْكِتَابِ That's also in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And I, get, I want to talk about this point in a little bit more detail uh, towards the end of the class, inshallah. A fourth example, accepting gifts or giving gifts to show them Islam or open their hearts to Islam. This is speaking generally. However, we don't exchange gifts on their holidays and say, oh, this is to convey da'wah. And, and we also don't exchange gifts that are prohibited. But overall, exchanging gifts is permiss permitted. The verse I mentioned, In Surah Al-Mumtahana, the first verse we took for this category. Imam Bukhari, in his, his book, he has a section, a title named Bab Qabul Hadiyyat Al-Mushrikeen. Bukhari, remember we talked about his sections, his chapters. He has a chapter called Accepting Gifts from Mushrikeen. And remember we mentioned that what, how the Bukhari titles his book is something scholars refer to. Ibn Umar narrated that his father, Umar ibn Khattab, seen a silk cloak being sold by some merchant. So Umar told the Prophet wasallam, buy this and wear it when congregation come to meet you, when the delegates come to meet you, and they visit you, when you go to Jum'ah, wear it. The Prophet wasallam, said, this is only worn by those people who have no share of the hair after. People doomed to hellfire are the ones who wear this. Later on, some silk cloaks were given to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as a gift. So he sent one to Umar Umar said to the Prophet وسلم, he went to the Prophet, he said, how can I wear it while you're the one who just earlier told me that it's for the people who have no share in the life after. The Prophet وسلم, said, I didn't give it for you to wear it, but rather for you to sell it or to give it to someone as a gift. Okay, here's the point. The Prophet وسلم, said he gave it to him to give away or to sell it. And if a Muslim doesn't wear silk, then where is it going to go? To an un-Muslim. So that's the established rule that Islam permits overall exchanging gifts with no additional factors. Uh, there's maybe additional factors that make it prohibited. What Umar did was Umar sent it to his pagan brother. In Mecca, before he migrated and before he embraced Islam. Umar gave a gift to his non-Muslim brother. And no one needs to tell you that Umar is the definition of wala and bara. And that the Prophet ﷺ told him to give it as a gift or sell it. He left it open. And Umar understand that he can give it to a non-Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ did not object. Also, uh, examples of this category is... Visiting non-Muslims for da'wah. I believe this is the sixth uh, example. You have the hadith in Sahih Muslim when the Prophet ﷺ visited a Jewish neighbor's uh, son. He was on his deathbed. The Prophet ﷺ sat by his head and he told him, Say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. The boy looked at his father and the father said, Listen to Abu Al-Qasim ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ left happy. Saying, Alhamdulillah, Allah rescued someone from hellfire with me. Alhamdulillah, alladhi anqadahu bi min al-nar. Alhamdulillah, alladhi anqadahu min al-nar. In two narrations. When I uh, mentioned two classes ago that there's those who crop out proof or portions of wala and bara, this is what I meant. There are those who take this category and make it as if it's everything. And deny category number one and two of wala and bara. This category explains the dealings. You have wala and bara in your heart, but it still explains the dealing parts. We treat them in that matter in obedience to Allah, who also told us that we must despise them and that which they worship at the same time. They've cursed Allah and transgressed on Allah's boundaries. So they are the enemies of Allah because of their belief. Yet at the same time, we're restrained in our dealings with them. Al-Qarrafi, in his book Al-Furuq, he mentioned and he said, 
that non-Muslims living under Muslim rule have rights upon us because they are our neighbors and they are under our protection and custody. He said that protection is a protection Allah offered them. In, in, in the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are dutiful to them while keeping the heart free from mawadda. The heart must not get tainted with mawadda to them. He said it only gets worse and dangerous if one's relationship to them causes him mawadda and to honor them are sacred their kufr and their rituals. rituals. He said that's a dangerous part there. Once any of the heart, any portion of the heart is affected and it taint, is tainted, then it turns to muwala. He also said, being dutiful to them in matters that don't create deficiency in one's bara from them and that what they believe is permissible. And he gave examples similar to the examples that I gave earlier. And he also added onto that, he said, being gentle to their elder, feeding their hungry. But you, look what he said, you got to keep the heart portion of it. Giving clothes to their needy, being kind to them in, in speech, being gentle and merciful as long as it does not come out of fear or loneliness. Al-Qarraf even said, you, being patient to your non-Muslim neighbor, if, if he harms you, being fully aware that you're at power to remove it, yet you're gentle to them, not out of fear or loneliness, but for the sake of conveying this message. No, this treatment is emphasized by the ulama and more so before that by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, to Ahl al-Dhimma who are non-Muslims living under Muslim rule. For example, you have al-Bukhari rahimahullah in Kitab al-Diyat, he said, uh, he has a section, Ithm man qatala dhimmiyan bighayri jurm. One who kills a non-Muslim who's living under uh, uh, Muslim rule for no reason. Why is that emphasized? He mentions the hadith Abdullah ibn Amr an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man qatala nafsan mu'ahadan lam, mu'ahadan lam yiruh ra'ihat al-jannah wa inna rihaha la yujadu masirata arba'in aam. Whoever kills a non-Muslim living under Muslim rule will not smell the smell of heaven even though the smell goes the distance of 40 years. Why is it emphasized so much to non-Muslims living under Muslim rule even though the Muslims may mingle with them elsewhere. The reason because when they're living under Muslim rule, they're weak and they're, they're uh, vulnerable. Unlike when they're elsewhere where they're strong, where they have family, they have back, uh, back in and they have support. In fact, in fact, uh, to, to back this up, the Sahaba gave sadaqah in charity to mushriks. Sadaqah to win their heart to Islam if they need it. Ibn Abbas did it. Ibn Amr. Ibn Amr did it. Radiallahu anhu. Aisha in the famous hadith. In Musnad Ahmad and Tirmidhi and in Bukhari. The famous hadith when Aisha was approached by a Jewish woman who came to her house and asked her for charity. And the Jewish woman, uh, after Aisha gave her charity, the Jewish woman said, May Allah protect you from the punishment of the grave. The Jewish woman telling Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha informed the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam what happened. She was surprised at what the Jewish woman told her. So she explained the situation and told, her what, told him what the Jewish woman told her. He said, yes, there's the punishment of the grave. Everyone hears it except the animal, even the animals, except the human beings. Had there been anything wrong with her taking the gift, uh, giving the sadaqah, or the Prophet ﷺ would have informed her because he's legislating and his silence is approval. Not having bara from them as in category one, the kufr aspect of it, or the second one, the haram aspect, does not conflict with treating them with the justice of the Quran and the Sunnah. I don't recall since I was a child that we ever had a neighbor to my father, next door to my father, who did not become Muslim by the will of Allah and then after that on, uh, 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 on the hands of my father, may Allah grant him a long life full of deeds. I remember in the mid 70s, as a child, a neighbor who used to fix my bike, an old man retired from the Navy. My father would always talk to him Islam. And I remember as a young, young kid, and this is back in the days when Islam was not as common as you heard today. 
It's rare for someone to say I'm Muslim or to know or hear of what Islam is. The, the neighbor took his shahada. And as a child, I remember that my father never left his bedside when he was on his deathbed. And he made sure to take a few Muslims to bear him the Islamic way. And he said this shahada in his final moments. And my father asked him while he was on his deathbed, when he could, was no longer able to speak, he put his hand on his hand. He said, squeeze my hand if you feel pleasure. And he did. Just a few weeks ago, I was walking into my father's house on Friday. And the neighbor told me, tell your father, thank you. An older lady. And I said, for what? She said, every Friday, he puts some groceries in front of my house for a long time. Wallahi, I, nor any member of our family, knew that for the longest time. That he's been doing it for a very long time. And as I began to speak to her, this old woman, who her own relatives don't even visit her. She told me she took her shahada, she's Muslim and she's working on her deen. Her own sons and daughters don't do this to her. Uh, does this treatment of kindness contradict with bala and bara, bara? Absolutely not. That's why we need to understand all three categories taken together. Muwala, number one, tawalli. Then the permissible type of dealing, which uh, uh, you can call exceptions or the permissible type of treatments.